entered a flying disc. And that was emphasized in Roswell. Correct. And that wasn't the only crash. Correct. Yeah. Can you uh, can you comment a little bit? Uh, I'm going to remind everybody that we're speaking to Ken Storch, all of our listeners on Inception Radio, and uh, we're uh, visiting with Ken Storch. One of the foremost uh, flying saucer investigators <laughs> <laughs> and authorities in the country, and has more information. We're talking a little bit about Roswell now, and uh, Ken, you hear about the Roswell incident, and, and there's so much emphasis on that. That wasn't the only crash, and there's a lot of controversy regarding the alien bodies that were taken. Uh, some were dead. Uh, controversy about some were still living. Uh, can you comment a little bit about that second crash and some of the bodies that were recovered? Well, let me let me tell you, and this is purely supposition on my part, but I, here's what I think happened, okay? And there's a lot of circumstantial evidence to indicate uh, that this transpired, uh, very little direct evidence that would indicate that it's happened. But in 1944 and 1945, the United States Navy... Uh, well, the U.S. Armed Forces inc encountered something that basically they weren't prepared for, and that was in the Pacific War, the kamikaze. Mm -hmm. And so when during the Battle of Okinawa, the United States Navy, uh, in order to protect the landing forces, uh, put picket ships every 26 miles from the main, from the main invasion force. They, they, put picket ships, or they were called picket ships, but they were like destroyers and destroyer escorts, with radar every 26 miles up to 100 miles. Mm -hmm. And the purpose of that was that after 26 miles, the U.S. Navy radar could, uh, kamikazes could fly under the radar beam because of the curvature of the earth. Mm -hmm. And so they would extend these picket ships out every 26 miles up to 100 miles, so that would give them ample warning that the uh, Japanese suicide pilots were headed towards the main fleet, and thus they could put up uh, uh, air, air cover and, and do what they could. And yet some of them still got through and crashed into the side of the invasion fleet. Several carriers were lost. Several troop ships were hit. Uh, cruisers were hit. But anyway, then we developed the atomic bomb. And the United mm -hmm. States Navy was very quickly to realize that, hey, if one of those suicide planes were to have an atomic bomb on it, it could take out the entire invasion fleet with just one plane. So they needed to have radar that extended beyond the horizon and that they could look over the horizon. Over the, it was called uh, over-the-horizon radar. You, you may recognize uh, the term now because it's used in, in weather a lot, but it's called Doppler radar. Doppler, yes. Okay, and they were able to bend the beam over the curvature of the uh, of the earth out on the ocean. The other thing the Navy was concerned about is that the Japanese Navy had a real nasty habit of hiding behind typhoons and thunderstorms in the ocean, and then all of a sudden they'd pop out from behind them, and they'd only be 10 or 12 miles away. And so the Navy wanted to be able to see inside a tropical storm, a thunderstorm. And so the reason why I bring that up is because the Navy was doing extensive radar research in the New Mexico desert. Now, if you recall, I believe it was July 8th or July 11th, one of those three days in there when the crash took place in 1947, there was a severe, severe electrical storm, thunderstorm, moving across the Roswell area. Uh, it was actually pretty intense by all weather accounts. If you research that time frame, you'll find out that it was a massive uh, storm front that moved across New Mexico. Actually, part of it came up into Oklahoma and Texas mm -hmm. as it went to the northeast. But it was that during that thunderstorm, and this, this is supposition on my part, that I think the United States, because the Navy was doing extensive over-the-horizon radar testing, that they turned on their powerful radar array, and they did have it down there. I've, I've been down to uh, Alamogordo and uh, White Sands, and uh, Navy radar towers are still standing. They're made out of, out of wood. Interesting mm, enough, I've seen those, yeah. as, as you drive along the road, they're about every 26 miles, 
there was a radar stanchion made out of wood. So mm-hmm. it was uh, resembling their picket ships that I talked about earlier. But they had built and developed a very powerful radar. I think... This massive storm that was moving across New Mexico, the United States Navy turned on their powerful radar site because it was a perfect opportunity for them to test their ability to see inside a massive thunderstorm. And lo and behold, there were two craft that were inside or near that thunderstorm. And as that powerful radar went by, I don't think their navigational systems were shielded for that type of electromagnetic energy, and they crashed into one another. Nobody knew it took place. Nobody was looking for them. Nobody had an idea. And those craft, one came down, I think, in the St. Augustine Plains or Plains of St. Augustine, and the other one, what, Corona, I think, down in Corona, New Mexico. Yeah, Corona, yeah. I may be wrong on that, but um, but I think those two craft came down. One of them, uh, apparently, according to eyewitnesses, had survivors when it hit the ground. But I think mm-hmm. that's my, that's my now. there's more to it than that, but in a nutshell, I think that it was purely an accidental uh, setup uh, by Mother Nature, and the U.S. Navy, I think, is the one that really brought those craft down, unbeknownst to them. Well, that was the, that was the impression that I had always had of that uh, of that double crash, that the Doppler or the radar that they were using literally fried their communications and abilities to, to control the craft. And like you said, they, they crashed into each other. And then when they crashed and, and hit the Earth, Weren't they, what, 50, 60, 70 miles apart? Uh, I think 200 miles. Uh, from 100 miles from, apart. I know yeah, there's quite the, a distance between the two. But you only, hear, you only hear commentary about one of them. Correct, yeah, which I find interesting. Yeah. They, Why is that? Why? I, I don't know. I they're, think they're, they're both equal importance. Well, you've got to keep in mind, it was, uh, what, five days later when the U.S. Army Air Corps said, hey, we recovered a flying disc, okay, and then, uh, you know, Ramey had to, had to put, uh, empty the uh, saucer story and, and make it a weather balloon. It would have been much difficult. Uh, and this is, once again, supposition on my part. <laughs> but it, you got two. What do you got? So two, weather two, two weather balloons? Two weather balloons. Yeah. That's right. yeah well, well, one weather balloon wouldn't work. <laughs> I mean, I, and then you'd have to have two Project Bogle balloons up at the same time. So I suspect that, you know, once they got rid of the first one, they didn't, then there was no mention of the second one, even though, Anybody that's done any research realizes that there were actually two crash sites. What does your research tell you regarding what happened to the craft and what happened to the beings' bodies, whether they were still alive or whether they were dead? What, uh, what does your research indicate to you uh, ultimately happened to them? Well, I think that uh, the debris and the wreckage was immediately gathered up mm-hmm. and flown uh, to uh, a, a portion of it, I think went to uh, where General Ramey was at his at uh, his base there in Texas. Uh, the other majority and the bodies and everything else, I I believe initially went to Wright Pat. Wright Patterson, uh, right? Okay, mm-hmm. and then from That's there, what I've always understood. Yeah, from there, I think it was uh, piecemealed out to d- different uh, laboratories uh, in the United States. And by the way, I I think. That the reason why you know you, you were, we as investigators and researchers are stymied by Freedom of Information Act uh, request FOIA request uh, from the Navy and the Air Force is that I think that big business took over. I think that mm-hmm. uh, that uh, a lot of the research and a lot of the wreckage uh, was handed over to. Uh, you know, General Dynamics, I'm, and, I'm, and I don't know for a fact that General Dynamics had anything to do with it. I'm just pointing that out there because they're a big corporation. And uh, Bell Laboratories, I think, probably uh, got some of it. And keep in mind, people, people well, how, why wouldn't they know about it? Because nobody told them. I, if you were a scientist and you came in, let's say you're working for Bell Laboratory, and you came into your office one day, and your boss or uh, Air Force or... Navy representative standing there and said, hey, uh, what do you make of this, uh, being able to transmit uh, information with uh, light beams? Do you ever think about exactly, that? Exactly, exactly. Okay, now we call it fiber optics. Fiber optics. Okay, right. but in 1947, 1950, back in those days, I, that's not what it was referred to. That wasn't called fiber optics. I think uh, I, I get into a lot of heated discussion because of laser, because people, oh, no, laser, we can prove where laser was developed. 
I have no doubts that that's where it was developed. Mm -hmm. But the idea and maybe the example of it that was given to somebody in Bell Laboratories said, hey, work on this, will you? What, what, is the, what is the possibilities of being able to transmit information using light? Um, yeah, I think it was piecemealed out to big corporations, and, and I think that's still going on today. Yeah. We can look at a perfect example, and it's called the Manhattan Project. Oh, yeah. There was over 110,000 people that worked on developing and building the nuclear bomb, and yet I think there was only 40 that really knew all the components when they put them together that they would have well, a nuclear that's bomb. that's true, and uh, I have a, a late uncle, uh, Dr. Milton O. Peacock. I lost him a few years ago. Uh, he worked on the Manhattan Project. He worked directly with Fermi for the development of the first atomic bomb. And uh, he told me a little bit about that years and years ago. Ken, we're going to take a short, short break. Hold that thought, and we're going to come back to you on that. We want to hear some more about it. It's a very fascinating uh, subject, and a lot of people are very interested. I want to remind all the listeners, you're listening to Inception Radio. This is Epic Voyages. I'm Roger Peacock. Ken Storch is our guest. We will be right back after a few words about this. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. I'm Roger Peacock. You're listening to Epic Voyages on Inception Radio, and our special guest tonight is Ken Storch. Uh, Ken, uh, I've always had a lot of questions and, and heard different theories about it. Let's talk a little bit about the uh, Piedmont, Missouri incidents and uh, some of the things, how that all ties back into 1973. Uh, you, had a ma you had some major sightings then. That was one of my first sightings was in the spring of 73. Let's talk a little bit about the Piedmont inc incident in Missouri. Yeah, I, uh, in June I was invited to come down and uh, give a talk, and it was based upon uh, proof beyond a reasonable doubt. That's the yes. law enforcement side that I've been involved in for 31 years versus scientific proof and the mm -hmm. difference and you will hear uh, academia will say well scientific proof uh, has a higher bar that it, its standards are higher than proof beyond a reasonable doubt and ironically Roger I agree with that mm -hmm. I uh, I don't have a problem with that even though Proof beyond a reasonable doubt will put a person on death row and ultimately get them executed. Sure will. Uh, I, I understand the bar that academia requires for scientific proof. Now, having said that, you will hear a number of skeptics, and I love this. Well, there is no scientific proof concerning the existence of flying saucers. <laughs> and I'm here to tell you that in Piedmont, Missouri... In 1973, uh, there was a, a, a flap, if you will, for about 18 months. Uh, mm -hmm. People were seeing all kinds of craft, all kinds of lights uh, going around Piedmont, Missouri, which is located in the southeastern portion of the state uh, down by Cape Dorado, if you're familiar mm -hmm. with your geography oh, yeah. of the U.S. Yeah. But uh, David Huntley and Chet Brinkley, I think, was the two ABC News commentators, and it, uh, this flap in Piedmont made national news. And, of course, uh, Huntley Brinkley report, they were, uh, were making fun of the people down in Piedmont. And I don't know which one it was, whether it was uh, Brinkley or Huntley, but one of them said, well, the people down in uh, Piedmont, Missouri, barely know what a knife and a fork and a spoon is used for. I remember that, yes. I remember them saying that. Oh, yeah. And it that just so, made some people mad, I'll tell well, you. Well, it made one individual uh -huh. mad because he happened to be the physics professor in charge of the physics department for uh, Southeast Missouri State College. Um, yeah. uh, and uh, he and his and his name um, was Harley Rutledge, Doctor Hartley Rutledge, Ph.D. in physics, and he was from Piedmont, Missouri, originally. And so when that comment was made, he loaded up his ten-year-old son Robert Rutledge, and they went back to his stomping grounds as a boy to Piedmont, Missouri, and lo and behold, Doctor Rutledge witnessed a unidentified flying object over Piedmont actually took several pictures of it with a 35 millimeter um, camera 
Well, he went back to, like I said, he was in charge of the physics department for Southeast Missouri State, and he applied for a research grant through the University of Missouri in the state of Missouri to study the Piedmont Lights. And, Roger, he was granted it. He did it for 18 months, and they put up all kinds of scientific instruments. Uh, we're talking magnometers. We're talking infrared cameras. We're talking uh, sound recording devices. There was a, a whole host of electronic scientific instruments that were deployed in Piedmont, Missouri. And it mm -hmm. wasn't at just one site. Dr. Rutledge had those equipment stationed at three different uh, areas around Piedmont, Missouri, and they were staffed by uh, students, physics students, uh, doing some uh, extracurricular work for the for the college, and they were able to obtain a plethora of data. I mean, when you see what the scientific community came up with, and I use that explicitly because I want to kind of like get in your face, skeptic, sure. that that. Uh, say there is no scientific proof. Dr. Luck Rutledge, in 18 months, acquired copious amounts of scientific data. And in his dissertation paper to the college and to the state of Missouri that funded this, he said, I can tell you what they are not. I can tell you that they are not birds. They are not misidentified aircraft. They are not meteors. They are not weather balloons. They are none of the mundane expl uh, explanations that have been given to the Piedmont Lights. He said, what I cannot tell you is who they are and what they are. But I, and this, and this is important, he states that he was very impressed with some, of the with some of the data that they collected because it indicated that some of these objects were under intelligent control. Control, exactly. Yeah, and those are his words, not mine. That was uh, Dr. Uh, Harley Rutledge that, uh, that said that. And he uh, ultimately <clears throat> stated that the scientific community, there needed to be a full-fledged nationwide study done of uh, the uh, unident unidentified flying object. Mm -hmm. And so when you hear somebody say, well, there is no scientific evidence, that's not true. Oh, boy. <laughs> and the other, the other little tidbit to that is I was given a talk and I said, well, let's let's define what scientific evidence would be. I mean, you look at the audience, and I would say, well, would you say that a stopwatch was a scientific instrument? And people, you know, you, well, yeah, because it measures time. Well, okay, what about a stethoscope? Would you consider that a scientific instrument? Well, of course it is. What about a, what about a telescope? What about a, a microscope? And then you go, what about radar? And there is probably hundreds if not thousands of cases i know i know of six of them right off the top of my head that uh have radar data and that's radar data not only from civilian radar but also from military radar and from uh inboard aircraft uh all concerning one specific incident mm -hmm. so there is plenty of radar or excuse me plenty of scientific data to uh back up the fact that uh Something's going on in and around and on this planet, and Absolutely. we really don't have any control over it. There is so much evidence. Uh, you know, a person uh, prosecuted for murder goes to court, and uh, they present photos, videos, credible witnesses, and the person is uh, convicted of murder and executed. Correct. And we have far more uh, of, of credible information and, and, and videos and photographs and history and, and uh, very well-known, highly regarded, credible uh, people that attest to the UFO, if you will, uh, craft, but yet it's all blown away and, and not given any credibility in, in a lot of circles. And uh, you take half that information, half that evidence, and you would be convicted of murder and executed. Well, I, I, you're right, Roger, and uh, it's. But I, I would say that it's taken credible in certain circles within uh, uh, government agencies. Um, mm -hmm. I know that the uh, Air Force says, and uh, to some ex lesser extent, the Navy says we no longer investigate 
uh, flying saucer reports. But that's not true. That's an out and out lie. Exactly. Uh, I have documents uh, as uh, as late as 2003, where the Air Force was highly interested in uh, flying saucer reports that were coming in from their own pilots. And mm-hmm. those reports never made it to the uh, mainstream media, or never made it out into the uh, into the uh, uh, realm of ordinary people because they were kept hush. Uh, one that comes to, comes to mind, and I know it was 1976, but it was over Iran, and it mm-hmm. was involved a Iranian. He's now retired, but he ultimately became a general. But when he landed his F-4 fighter in Tehran. And uh, keep in mind, that's when the Shah of Iran was supposedly mm-hmm. our ally. United States Air Force officials not only confiscated his gun camera film, but they debriefed him for about six hours and what he encountered, uh, encountered rather, uh, over the skies of Iran. In uh, 1998, <clears throat> there were two Navy pilots flying off a carrier in the uh, in the Caribbean on a on a joint exercise and they encountered a flying disc now there's all kinds of speculation that it you know went under the ocean and there's an underground base out by Puerto Rico or whatever but these two navy pilots uh attempted uh, an interception because it was real close to the battle fleet, when I say close, within 150 miles, and they were instructed to intercept and, if necessary, to shoot down the object. Now, they, as far as we know, they never were able to uh, get close enough to get um, lock on with uh, missiles, but they had visual and radar tracking mm-hmm. aboard those two aircraft of an object that was uh, uh, outmaneuvering their aircraft, and the battle fleet, the uh, combat information center of the aircraft carrier was also recording the uh, mm-hmm. the incident. So, yeah, if for one minute, if and you got to stop and ask yourself something, Roger. After nine eleven, okay, anything that comes into our airspace that doesn't have a transponder on it that's not being identified, do you think the Air Force and the and the uh, Air Defense Command is going to take an interest in it? I don't give a damn if it is an unidentified flying <laughs> object. They're going to want to know who, what, where, why, and how it's there. That's right. Now, the interesting thing is that I've always uh, found out is that the civilian air- airline pilots, as well as military pilots, they may have these experiences. They may might make it an initial report of it when they arrive back at their base or at their air uh, at the airport. But that report really doesn't go any further because that's a career buster right there. Oh, yeah. I, I, You'll ruin your career if, if you get the reputation of, of uh, you know, reporting UFOs in the military or even as a civilian uh, airline pilot. Well, and I, I mean, you got to hand it to the government. That's a hell of a stop gap. I mean, somebody's career uh, is on the line, uh, and you're able to use that kind of leverage and it, and it doesn't have to be direct. It just has to be subtle. I mean, mm-hmm. you can circulate those rumors. If you talk about it, your career is over with. And exactly. and, that, and that can come from a, just from the rumor mill. It doesn't have to be, uh, you know, you're called in on the carpet and have a commanding general, uh, you know, walk you up one side and down the other. That could that that type of pressure and that type of uh, of uh, silencing can be very subtle. And you only have to say, hey, your career is on the line. You really want to go with this? You really yeah. want to talk about it? You really want to report it? And that's very you're effective right. also. Oh, one of the, one of the most effective. Hell, hell, I saw it done in law enforcement work. Mm-hmm. Okay, I mean, you, you could you could silence a witness. You could silence uh, 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 an officer uh, from from admin saying, "Hey, you don't need to talk about this anymore." You know, the, you you want to, How about that promotion that's coming up? How would you like to mm-hmm. have that? Well, okay. in your own, own experience, when you got out of the Air Force, you couldn't talk about it for thirty years. Right, and if you and read you, were, that, you weren't even in the Air Force anymore. No, you were but, out and gone. And but because I was active duty at the time the incident occurred, exactly. I was still governed by the Uniform Code of Military Justice. And when you sign that, and they tell you hey, it, it doesn't make any difference if you're back on the farm in Missouri, if you uh, disclose what transpired, hey, you know the alphabet boys could show up at your door and you know cart you away. And there have been cases. They only have to do it one or two times. Uh, to, to demonstrate that the capabilities there and the rest is all 
you know, history, as they would say. Yeah, that's, a, that's a scary pros uh, prospect that the military and the government and even the civilian authorities have that much control over suppression of good, solid-based information from credible witnesses, and then we wonder, why don't we know? I had an opportunity to sit in a uh, hotel room with four or five other researchers with Edgar Mitchell, uh, who astronaut uh, walked on the moon, mm -hmm. Gordon Cooper, who's another astronaut, and both of them had um, uh, unidentified flying object um, experiences. Uh, Gordon mm -hmm. Cooper was very definite about what he saw. They were flying disc. He makes no bones about it. And uh, uh, Edgar Mitchell said that, hey, when we were going to the moon, we had an object that followed us in there and then picked us up and followed us back. And he said, right. you don't get that unless, unless someone or something is piloting that, the craft. An intelligent control. Yeah, and uh, it was, uh, it, even though they were reporting it to uh, Houston Control, uh, Edgar Mitchell said, hey, once, so they, once they got back, it was very explicit, hey, we're not going to talk about this incident. That's not well, going to be discussed. It was interesting also when we went around uh, the dark side of the moon for the first time uh, and came back around. One of the code words for UFOs or unidentified objects was Santa Claus. Santa Claus, right. And when the astronauts came around the moon, one of the comments that got out through NASA over the air before they had a chance to cut it off was, yes, Alice, there's definitely a Santa Claus. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> and there were several references that uh, Santa's sleigh is still following us. Exactly. And there was, uh, there was supposedly uh, sighted and identified a moon base on the dark side of the moon where there was landing strips and buildings and two or three craft, and one of the uh, astronauts even made the comment, said, wouldn't you like to fly one of those babies? Gordon Cooper <clears throat> said that he was at Holloman Air Force Base, mm -hmm. and a flying disc came and landed at the end of the runway and sat down on three pods. And he watched... <coughs> Excuse me. He watched it... Uh, sitting there, and a film crew filmed the craft. Good grief. And Gordon Cooper said that he had an opportunity to look at the film before it was put on a special courier and flown, uh, he thinks, to the Pentagon. But he'll tell you, he goes, I have no idea where that film went and who has it today. But he said, I know the craft was at the end of the runway at Holloman Air Force Base, and I know that they filmed... Uh, and got tons of uh, 35 and uh, 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 f film of the craft. He said, I saw the negatives. I saw the craft. I, saw, I know they filmed it. And he said, I, I have no idea where that is. And all of it was locked up and kept away from uh, the public and will never be disclosed until disclosure. We're at the top of the hour, Ken. It's 9 o'clock, and uh, we want to remind our listeners that uh, they're certainly welcome to start calling. The telephone number toll-free is 888-919-2355. You're listening to Inception Radio Network, and we are Epic Voyages. We're interviewing and visiting with a good friend, uh, Ken Storch, and we're inviting our listeners to go ahead and start calling. We're going to be taking questions and answers, and uh, Ken is going to be addressing those starting now. It's 888-919-2355. Hope to hear from some of our good listeners uh, as we uh, go on through the uh, third half hour of the show down at the bottom of the hour. It's now about one minute past nine. Uh, Ken, you had uh, you had some uh, reports or some information regarding the, some of the latest flying saucer research and plans that you have. Uh, what's going on as far as the latest information that you've been involved in? Well, I, 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 I my approach to the flying saucer problem has been from a law enforcement perspective mm -hmm. and 